Many people ask, are we running oil and oil? And of course, eventually we will. But I don't think this is going to happen for, for very many years. And we're about, we've used as much in the past as we have left in the future, approximately. Maybe just less than half, you could say. But um, this, 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 this uh, change from having more in front of you than to, to having more behind you is, is really a, a, a fundamental turning point that affects the whole way in which the world uh, lives. And uh, we might move on from that a little bit and, and think a bit more in global geopolitics in this whole situation a little bit. In the United States situation then, it has, it has been importing oil from the Middle East. It depends on foreign imports. And um, in fact, it's long been official government policy announced for many years now that access to foreign oil is for the United States a vital national interest justifying, where necessary, military intervention. Well, now, up till now, uh, this uh, potential threat of military intervention was based on the fear of, of temporary interruptions for political reasons where some country might might stop uh, exports for whatever reason. But now the situation changes a little bit because it's not now a, a temporary political interruption somewhere, it is facing the iron grip of depletion. And that in turn means that uh, not only is the United States depending on, on Middle East supply, but so is the rest of the world. China is, is desperately trying to increase its economy, you know, it has aspirations to to be a two-car family, you know, like everybody else. So the Chinese are going to be looking for access to Middle East oil. The third world, Africa, although their needs are small, they're also going to be wanting access. And under the principles of globalism, this new globalism idea, it's a tenet of, of globalism that the resources of the world should be available to the highest bidder. Now that clearly is the United States at the present time. And so we face um, a kind of conflict, of the first uh, steps of which uh, are already being uh, uh, unfolded in front of us, whereby um, access to these critical supplies of oil, um, which is critical to the agriculture of the countries, critical to their well-being, the whole economy depends on this, is moving from some kind of market-driven thing to which political incidents might be superimposed it now faces the iron grip of, of, of depletion. So nature is now imposing this. And so this is an entirely new situation. I would say the, the first solution, the absolute simple first solution, is to use less of the stuff, you know. And we are all so incredibly wasteful in, in the way we use energy that, that uh, there's a great deal that we could do without any pain at all. That's the, the first step. Moving on from there, uh, well, every kind of renewable energy that uh, can be reasonably done sh should be done, of course. And here I would see the, just hearing it today, it seems to me this tidal uh, rotors offers the very best thing. I, I find these wind farms rather, rather ungainly. They d detract a bit from the scenery, um, and they are, uh, they are not constant supply. They, fluctuate with wind supply, whereas the tide goes on relentlessly. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a bit less confident about biomass. Uh, maybe something can be done in that direction, but I would have thought with sensible planning, uh, sensible usage, I, I think it would be a very good idea to, to have every uh, kind of energy audit of every house. You know, you would have a a penalty if you were inefficient in your use of energy and you'd have some incentive for being good at it. And, and uh, so one could very, I think, very easily cut the demand for, for energy quite radically here. And uh, I think with the proper use of renewables, you, you get by for, for a while. And it's only a question of how soon you do it because there's no avoidance mm -hmm. in the longer term. So I think, arising out of all of this wider oil picture, you may find a return to that more local, local kind of communities where people live in better harmony with, with, with themselves primarily, with, with each other, and above all with uh, their environment and the, the natural resources that are at their disposal.
They may live much more simple lives than we do today, but that's not to say it might not be happier lives in many respects. More generally, I think if one had a more regional and local kind of uh, basis for life, uh, one would have less corrupt governments because the politicians would be closer to the people who they represented, so probably improve the caliber of the politicians, and uh, in general people would have a kind of cohesion and cooperative uh, feeling of between them that would help them face this inevitable problem of the future. And I think every country has to really, uh, I don't know, some people speak of global solutions and uh, in some regards perhaps there are, but uh, personally I, I feel the better way to go is to, to, to start at home and try to fix up your little corner of the world uh, in some kind of sustainable, reasonable way. And I think if everybody would concentrating, concentrate in, in dealing with their own their own situation and what nature has delivered them and find some solution within that context, it would make a lot more sense than being some victim of a distant uh, globalized market controlled by all sorts of people you don't know who they are.